Hello and welcome to our event, our webinar. Um, I'm Dr. Samantha May and I'm really proud to be here with one of our current postgraduate students, Mr. Stuart Dello. Um, I'm actually going to ask Stuart to, to lead most of this session because Stuart um, has this student experience that you who are prospective students will actually want to hear about. I'll jump in when Stuart would like me to, but um, over to Stuart. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, yeah, my name is Stuart. Uh, it's nice to uh, nice to see everyone here today. Uh, I'm going to be delivering this webinar on postgraduate politics and international relations uh, here at the University of Aberdeen. Um, so to start off, let's uh, strike you know right to the heart of the issue: Why study politics and international relations? Fair question. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that right now uh, politics and international relations are in a very strange uh, place globally. Um, there's a lot of uh, changes happening in terms of power, the international stage, stability and world order. Uh, all of these things are sort of taking on new forms and shapes and the programs that uh, the University of Aberdeen has to offer really help us kind of hopefully come to some kind of grips with it. Um, the programs we're going to look at today explore some of the real world issues that uh, affect all of our daily lives, including globalization, political economy, human rights and governance, War and conflict and security. Um, me personally, I've just uh, I'm just completing the uh, MSc in international relations, um, and I've had specific classes on some of these exact issues: uh, globalization and uh, conflict and security, specifically, um, including Sam's very interesting class on religion, conflict, and security. Highly recommend. Um, uh, so th those are some just some of the things that uh, you'll probably end up studying uh, if you go that route. Um, and in terms of the nuts and bolts of it, there's also, uh, e you know, the university really strives to help students develop like analytical skills, research skills, um, but also the kind of interpersonal skills and soft skills that lead to post-graduation employment, um, which I think is really valuable. And the university does have a uh, student employment center that uh, where people can sit down with you and give you some help on how to like uh, shape your career and what to maybe shoot for after you graduate. They're very good for that, very helpful. And at the bottom of the slide here it says especially as the demand for social scientists increases um you know the faster things change the faster the you know the, the greater the demand for new uh kinds of research that hit the gaps in our current knowledge uh and i, I think that demand really is increasing uh so Hopefully it was pretty uh, done QED. We know why to study these things. I assume most anybody who's in this webinar is already kind of interested in it. But why uh, do it at the University of Aberdeen? <clears throat> so Aberdeen is uh, recently been ranked seventh in the UK for international relations and ninth in the UK for politics. Uh, it's been in the top 10 student satisfaction, like overall student satisfaction rankings for three consecutive years and in a more sort of holistic level um, at Aberdeen. Uh, we really try to engage with uh, key contemporary issues that affect government and non-government organizations. You know, typically uh, one thing that we uh, we all learned in this, me and my classmates all learned in this MSc, is that uh, the 
uh, discipline of uh, disciplines of politics and international relations really changing to encompass not just the things that governments do, but also uh, you know increasingly important non-governmental organizations like international NGOs, but also like non-state actors and things what people might call terrorists or insurgents or uh, ideological groups. You know, really try to engage with all of the forces shaping politics today. Um, also, you know, businesses, uh, political economy, and human rights governance. Uh, again, that's just uh, those are a few of the most prominent sort of words and terms, but you really get a sweeping view of the forces shaping politics today. And a real uh, valuable thing here is that you learn from people who are actively involved in research. Um, we're home to several research centers, including Center for Global Development, Center for Global Security and Governance, Institute for Conflict, uh, Transition and Peace Research, and loads more. Um, you can you know, Google any of those to find out what's up. Um, right now, I'm doing my dissertation uh, on the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, and my supervisor is actively involved in researching. It sounds very interesting. I haven't uh, read it yet, but it, it sounds like it's going to be very interesting. Uh, protest movements within uh, within Russia against the uh, conflict situation. So, you know, she's really uh, doing something that is relevant to, like, a conflict that's happening in the world right now, and it's very cool to learn from her and get the benefit of her insight. Yeah, I don't know. Anything, Sam, what do you think? Is there anything about these um, uh, research centers or institutes that you'd like to mention? I think it really is just emphasizing what you've already said, is that we're all actively trying to to research and teach and all come together. The whole point about um, these research centers is we're trying to come together collaboratively. And um, Stuart has been involved with some of our politics and IR seminars so we can hear papers being developed at the time not when they're finished but when they're being developed so it's really great to get input from people like Stuart and our colleagues who can help shore up our research and our writing before we even go to publication so I think it's a a very com um, camaraderie kind of idea you know where we learn from each other by the time you're postgraduates you're our colleagues you know, absolutely hmm. yeah yeah, thank you. I, yeah, that is that's great. Yeah, the, the, thanks for reminding me. Those were some very interesting. They do, we do have seminars every couple of weeks in the in the school that you can uh, just go to. I found not a lot of students took advantage of that. A couple did, but they're always very very interesting. Everything from like uh, nuclear weapons to uh, 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 like civic architecture in in uh, the former Soviet bloc. Very cool. Um. Anyway, right. Well, let's look at the actual programs that you could choose from. Um, we've got energy politics and law. Uh, we've got international finance and political relations, we've got international political economy. Um, I'm doing the, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, I'm doing the international relations MSC at the top of that second list there, but uh, you can specialize in any one of these. Energy politics looks at, you know, the intersection between obviously uh, energy economics, energy related issues and legal frameworks, international finance and political relations, uh, a little more economic and money centered. In the international political economy, I also teach on this um, alongside colleagues from both politics and IR and sociology, so it's interdisciplinary. Neither me or Stuart are going to go into depth for all of our programmes because we've got loads. We're just going to talk about the ones that we are really, really familiar with and happy to answer any questions you have. But international political economy is really talking about the way the economy, political economy, has been shaped historically, um, the world powers and the power dynamics in that, and how that power dynamics are changing. We are, we're in a world now where the, the rising powers of, say, China, even Russia, and are, are changing the world and we have new alignments like what we call the BRICS which are Brazil, Russia, um, India, China and South Africa that are challenging the old 
um, contemporary political systems. So we look at wealth, we look at poverty, we look at how financialization and neoliberalism has has caused uneven development and, and more problems. Um, I also look at feminist political economy and question global development and the theories behind it and the one size fits all or nobody um, model that is usually employed. So anybody interested in international political economy is a, either a really interesting programme or you could take it as a standalone course if you were doing, say, um, MSc and IR or even strategic studies. Next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Sam also uh, teaches a class that uh, do, do you know if your if your uh, religion class will also be in the MSc in the coming year as well? Yes, it will be. Good. Yes. Awesome. Uh, yeah, very interesting course. But yeah, the in international relations uh, sort of looks at the it's a bit more general in the sense that it looks at the discipline of international relations as a whole. But uh, you get some very uh, like you can choose a broad uh, swath of electives. So uh, Sam's course, which I've mentioned before, was religion, conflict and security, uh, the effect of like ideologies and religions on uh, conflicts, but uh, available everything from just like general conflict studies to China uh, related security issues, specifically globalization, um, lots of interesting stuff. And uh, the structure of the course is such that you have sort of one core class that you have to take, which is like historical concepts in international relations. And then the other courses are pretty much up to you. Um, and even within that core uh, class, it's really, uh, there's a lot of dialogue and you're really down to existential or uh, ontological questions. You know, what is a nation? Is it a relatively recent concept? Can reasonably say they've always existed? Stuff like that. Um, and uh, then you, uh, after you have just your two semesters and your dissertation stage, it's pretty straightforward. But uh, I find it very interesting and you get a wide range of different people from the social sciences department lecturing in the core class. So you get a lot of different perspectives, which is one thing I found really valuable about it. Um, and I guess international relations is one of the, the core programs we have, um, but there's different pathways if you want. So if you wanted to sort of have international relations and international law, you could do that, international relations and management. What that does though is limit the sort of flexibility that Stuart's had because he's only had one core course. If you do international law, you've got to do the international law courses. So there's um, advantages and disadvantages depending on what you want, but I guess it depends what it is you want to do in your future, what you think will give you the best options for whatever careers and professions you want to go into the future. Mm. Yes, and uh, on that note too, if uh, you wouldn't want to press it too hard, I guess, but I have known some other like students who are uh, really like had a, an idea to do something a bit different and they're like they're getting a specific degree. I know what, the, the one that pops to mind, I have one colleague who is getting a master's specifically in, it was not listed here, but it's specifically in like conflict and security studies. She's the only person who's getting it and she's working specifically with the uh, lecturer who teaches that course. So, you know, if you're really particularly interested in something, um, you know, talk to somebody, see what, um, See what's up. Um, yeah, there's uh, here's an, a list of some more programs that you can get into. We've got strategic studies, strategic studies and diplomacy, strategic studies and energy security, studies in international law, studies in management. Um, yeah. Loads. I guess the strategic studies. Um, I think that program's been running at the University of Aberdeen for about forty years now. Um, again, that concentrates a lot on war, conflict, security, kind of the bread and butter of international relations. It can be really good for anybody thinking about sort of military or armed services and things like that, or security intelligence kind of work. But mm. um, yeah, this is definitely your bit. This is definitely your <laughs> bit. Your... <laughs> yeah, of course, the student experience. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, distill the, the essence of the experience here. First of all, before you, you can see in this picture, 
these students are sitting in front of this sort of like bluish pattern thing. Um, this is not just like a stock photo. This is a real building at the university. This is our library. Um, although the, the, the campus is like very, very old and full of picturesque type buildings, the actual library is extremely modern and uh, very cool, very nice. Uh, inside uh if you like google it it's in very interesting architectural uh feature but it is one sort of symbol of the student experience at aberdeen it's it's cool looking um but as i mentioned uh one of the hallmarks of the student experience at the university of aberdeen is the careers and employability factor so i've really go out of their way to uh, and i noticed this even in the lectures themselves uh, lectures like uh, the lovely Sam trying to uh, mention when something that uh, so something that came up in the course of the lecture was connected to employability, you know, or when an assignment that we had to do could really be applied to real life intelligence work or NGO work or so on and so on. You know, everyone's sensors are very tuned to that. Um, as I try to instill skills like communication, research, negotiating, uh, analyzing statistics, team building, and all the things uh, listed there. And also, the you can see from the large number of programs that we sort of like blitzed through on the last four slides, uh, our graduates at Aberdeen go on to a wide variety of sectors. Um, from local government, charities and public policy to media journalism and uh, risk assessment. I Me mean, personally, I just applied for a job recently with, a, I, I've got a, a part-time job teaching English here. That's been my career up to this point, but uh, the school that I teach for has uh, just advertised a job, which was very interesting uh, for like, uh, I think the name is like soft power analyst, but they sort of like, you look at the, somebody to analyze how well the school's uh, lessons are like interacting with the uh, international cultures of the students themselves. The job I never would have thought of, uh, never would have thought existed before, you know, turning my research towards international relations, but also when I would never have thought to apply for uh, in a million years. But uh, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll see how that goes. But it, it sort of opened opens your mind to lots of different possibilities, um, things you never thought of, and that's a real value. Uh, pursuing your education, you know, part of it is getting to learn stuff you're interested in, but part of it also is just uh, being opened up to things that you didn't even know were out there that you could align your life towards. Anyway, we have here some uh, student testimonials, a few pages of them. Uh, yeah, just if I could maybe come in here, because I think it links Please, with employability yeah. and things. So well, put, um, slide back here there now. are testimonials. If we go back to the first one of testimonials. The first one, we have Lisa here. Lisa was, um, she decided to stay on as a postgraduate after doing her undergraduate with us. Um, Lisa, if you ever listen to this, you're amazing. Then we have Bastian. Bastian was actually in the Religion and Conflict class the year before you, Stuart. Bastian just embraced every single thing that the university had to offer, as did Carmona, who who actually arrived slightly later than his peers because of visa problems and then came out with a first uh, distinction. Just amazing. And if we go to the next slide, I can tell you about those as well. Oh, I get excited when I see my old students. Oh, there we have Cassie. Cassie was originally from Australia. After she graduated, she did several years in the Scottish Parliament before returning to Australia and her family. And at the bottom, we have um, Sebastian. So, Sebastian, if you're listening at ever, ever, congratulations on your new job. He was offered a sort of postgraduate employment as well. On the same day, he was offered a place in the officers' corps of the army. Um, Sebastian's worked extremely hard. He's another one that also stayed with us from his undergraduate to his postgraduate. So I hope these little testimonials, I know that you listening, don't know who these people are. I do. <laughs> They're my family. They're, <laughs> you know, once you come with me, I I, I find it very difficult to let you go. Um, I'm so proud of what they have achieved and I hope that demonstrates the, the employability um, part and 
as Stuart was saying, our graduates go on to do some amazing things, whether it's in local parliament, we've got parliaments across the world. Our students are really, really international. Uh, that adds for your employability and professional networks, but it also makes for amazing discussions in class. You've got so many different perspectives and lived in experiences. And whether you like the people in your class or not is kind of besides the point. Keep those networks. You never know when you're going to need them. Um, and I think just the, the testimonials of students that decided to stay with us gives you an indication of, of the kind of quality you get at University of Aberdeen. Thank you, Stuart. Mm. Indeed. No, thank you very much. Um, yeah, quite agree. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's a really special environment. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, from the like in a program like this, you meet a lot of people who are very driven, who really seem to want to make the world a better place. The other students and the lectures as well. And I just think that's a great vibe, great energy, you know, to be a part of. All right, the slideshow informs me that uh, is uh, time to take some of your questions. So whatever it is, uh, just throw it out and either uh, Sam or I will do our best to answer it. Thank you, both of you, first and foremost, for some fantastic insights into not only the International Relations MSc, but studying politics and IR um at a postgraduate level at the university so sam i think you've already touched on this a little bit um but this is just going back to something we just discussed um going over the alumni testimonials someone said you sound really passionate about your students which you absolutely are um and asking even though there are so many different programs does it feel like a fairly small cohort so i suppose is there a chance for a lot of overlap between programs for students to get to know one another and to know um, program coordinators of other programs? Um, I think Stuart can also help here as well. But because, as Stuart said, when he was doing his MSc and IR, there's like one core course and the other courses are electives. And some of those elective courses are shared across the programs. So you, you definitely get a chance to sort of meet students who might have come in to do the MSc and IR, but are also doing strategic studies or maybe international political economy. So, for instance, my own course that Stuart's mentioned, the Religion, Security and Conflict, that is open to those doing strategic studies, IR and international political economy. So that way you get to meet each other even if you're coming from slightly different perspectives. Um, Stuart, what was your kind of experience? Uh, yeah, I find uh, I found that you would see uh, some of the same people uh, enough to uh, get to know a few of them. If I think back, the people that I spent the most time uh, like hanging out with outside of class, were, it was me and another guy from IR, uh, like the uh, pure IR and then a couple of uh, law and IR students um, who we knew from the core class. Uh, and, but yeah, over over the core, most of my classes, if I think back, were pretty even split between like IR, strategic studies and international political economy. Uh, and then there might be one or two, uh, some other program, but it was mostly those three, uh, you know, different permutations of, and uh, you got to know, most people by uh, face, if not by name, uh, and and I found it pretty easy to make friends. It did have a sort of, you know, smallish feel. I think some of our classes might be the smallest, might be about ten ish, and maybe the largest twenty five, something like that. Thirty. Yeah, I think they were one. all in the teens. Yeah. All of mine were in the teens or twenties, but. Could be, could be. Yeah, different years um, takes different in, but you know, you shouldn't really expect like a huge, we should be able to get to know each other. I mean, I get to know all my students' names within about two weeks. You know, mm. it's, it's not huge numbers, but also it's not tiny, tiny. So you do have an opportunity to, to meet different people. So I think it's a nice number for postgraduate, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Aberdeen itself is uh, quite a, a small city. You know, you see people around a lot um 
it's very uh very convivial try, uh, try try not to sow bad blood with anybody <laughs> that's important very good point. Um, that actually leads really nicely into another question. Uh, Stuart, I'm going to pick on you for this one. Um, someone's asking, how is Aberdeen as a city for students? Um, so asking, is there a lot you can kind of get involved in at the uni? Is there stuff to do in town? Like what, how would you recommend the city um, and your experience as a student? Uh, I quite like it. Uh, I've been traveling around for some years and I mostly live in quite bigger cities. Uh, this is the smallest place I've lived in a long, long time. And uh, but it's even that that it's 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 like not teeny tiny. It's uh, got uh, there, there is a lot going on and there's loads of university societies. Um, even like the the freshers uh, fair in in the first week is always a great thing to go do. Even if you feel like you know you guys are coming into the uh, postgraduate level, you, you may not feel like hanging out with a bunch of like undergrads. And I totally get that. But you can still you can uh, if you if you pay attention to what's going on at the uh, freshers week, you can find loads and loads of uh, societies. I think I joined four or five of them. Uh, and I actually went to the meetings too, you know, uh, there's fun stuff going on. And if if you can picture it, it's kind of like the university and the, the student housing and the things, you know, the, the bars and parks that everyone goes to are sort of like up here in the north of the city. Um, and then the main part, like uh, is uh, sort of down south of that, maybe about 30 minutes walk or a short bus ride away. So there's uh, loads of stuff happening outside of the university as well, but like not far away. So you can kind of have your uh, pick about, you know, which side of, of, of Aberdeen, you know, physically, but spiritually also like, you know, do more student stuff or you want to do, just like get to know what local things are, events, yeah, loads of stuff. It's a fun place. If I can just big up our student societies, we've got nearly 300 different societies and some of them are, you know, academic. So we've got a politics and IR society. It's bright. And um, one of my colleagues who runs the strategic studies, so it's like a war games thing that he does. But there's also a whole heap of just simply hobby fun stuff which I think is really important. It's not just academics, we're, we're humans. So we want to do the things that gives us joy. So if the cocktail society sounds good to you, go for it. If you want to join the wizarding world of Aberdeen, there's pretty much everything. And if there isn't a student society on your hobby, you you form it, you found it. Um, there's a, over a hundred different sports kind of clubs. We've also got an um, sports village, which is relatively new. It's got an Olympic sized swimming pool, FIFA approved, what do you call it, pitches, things. Not clearly not a football fan, me. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a whole heap of stuff there. We're also right next to the beach. And, you know, if you're hiking and things like that, nature, we're not that far away from the Highlands. Mm -hmm. It's actually gorgeous. Yeah. It is Thanks. definitely Thanks. beautiful. I think it's um, it's just what you make it, isn't it? It's a great little city. It's a great university for such a relatively small campus, especially maybe for international students thinking of coming from, you know, larger undergraduate experiences. I'm thinking particularly if someone went to undergraduate in America, it might be a smaller campus than you're used to, but that doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that what you can get involved in is any less. Um, there's so much that you can do. And we're very close to Edinburgh and Glasgow and all that, just a short train ride away as well if you fancy a little field mm -hmm. trip. There's one thing that's nice about the UK if you are coming from like America or Canada like I am or or uh, Australia like you'd be so jazzed at how little time it takes you to get to like the uh, stuff on the like the middle of the country or like the other side of the country you'd be zooming all over. Yeah absolutely it's it's definitely a change of pace um but it's fantastic um so pivoting a bit back more towards the academic, um, someone's asked for Samantha, um, for Dr. May. Do you find a lot of students are coming back to uh, school after working for a while? Do a lot of students go from undergraduate directly into postgraduate, a good mix? Um, any advice that you would give someone who might be returning 
after some time away from academia? I think it's definitely a good mix. Um, some, obviously, some students choose to go directly from undergraduate to postgraduate. That's not something I myself did. I took a couple of years break. Um, as do some of, yeah, I, I would say um, a good chunk of our students have had a little bit of a break, maybe done some paid employment, tried what it's like out there in the real world. Many of us didn't like it and came back. Um, so I think it's a good mix. I think my number one tip, if you are returning to study after a while, don't let your imposter syndrome get you get to you. Don't think it's been such a big time since you've done it that you can't possibly do it now that you've lost the skills. You probably will be a bit rusty, but give yourself a couple of weeks and you'll be back in there, honestly. Don't let that put you put you off. If you have had a break, that can allow you to bring bring something different to the table and discussions that maybe somebody that has gone straight from undergraduate to postgraduate hasn't got. You know, you've got lived experiences, you've maybe got professional experiences. This can be really useful, not just to your classmates, but also for me to, to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the world in terms of real employment at the stage you're at. Um, so I guess my number one tip is, is don't let it frighten you if you've had a break, because many of us do feel a bit frightened, like we're going to have lost our, our skills. You haven't lost your skills. It will come back. Mm. It just, it's a re-emphasis and a retraining of the brain. But um, when you do come back, I hope you have a wonderful time. Uh, most definitely. Uh, I, I finished my undergrad in 2011, uh, so I had quite a lengthy break of uh, working and traveling, and it, uh, I, I think, it, if anything, it helped me. Um, I found it to be a great environment for that. That's great. Thank you both. Um, yeah, I think no matter whether you're going directly from undergraduate to postgraduate, or as you say, taking some time off, getting some you know, real world experience, um, you'll have a great time either way. So someone's asking uh, if we're not sure which pathway we want to take. So particularly, I suppose, for some of uh, the strategic studies core program, the international relations core program, where there might be some additional options and some joint programs, especially with other schools. Um, can we get advice from the School of Social Science to help us decide which program is best for us? Oh, nearly forgot to turn my, on my um, mic. Yes, absolutely. We'd absolutely be delighted to if you give us an email and just say this is the situation you're in. This is what you're thinking of doing in the careers. What? You, yeah. At the end of the day, it's always going to be your decision and what you're going to um, enjoy the most. But we would love to hear from prospective students. So do p feel free to to email either myself or any of my colleagues um, that's on the programs. We'd absolutely delight to hear from you and, and offer as much support as we possibly can. Um, I think really at the end of the day, think about what it is you want to do in your future and think about what it is that you're going to enjoy the most. Um, a lot of prospect, um, employers and professional institutions really are looking for how well you did rather than what you did. And you're going to do better in things that you're you're really excited about. It's, if you're excited about it, it's going to keep you doing that reading, keep you doing the writing at times when maybe your friends are off partying. You know, um, doing what really lights that fire in your stomach is is really important, and it's the thing that will give you meaning and joy. But absolutely, please do reach out to to whoever that you think might be. Um, the most relevant person um, and we would love to hear from you and give as much support and advice and and it would just be even great to just have a little chat yeah please do yeah absolutely um every prospectus page for each program has contact information for the director for said program so you could just go onto the website um, for the program that you're thinking of click on the program director's name and that'll give you their direct email um, Stuart, we're going to come back to you. So you had mentioned towards the start of this discussion um, mm -hmm. what you are actually doing for your final dissertation. So yes. how did you pick your dissertation topic? Um, and can you just give a bit of insight into that process, how that's been for you? Sure, yeah, happy to. Um, I'm researching the uh, current legal framework in Ukraine, specifically about languages and how Ukrainian 
language and Russian language are regulated in Ukraine, what it means for the conflict and especially what it means for Ukraine's bid for European Union accession. Um, uh, as for how I chose it, I knew I wanted to I knew coming into this program that I wanted to do something about Ukraine because uh, in the course of my uh, uh, previous career teaching English, I've actually uh, lived in some post-Soviet countries uh, in the past, and it's a part of the world that I found very, very interesting. So I knew I wanted to do something related to that. The Ukraine conflict is the biggest thing happening. I don't think it's any exaggeration to say it's the biggest thing happening in the that like in the Eastern European uh, cultural sphere at the moment. So it seemed like a natural choice to do something related to that. And yeah, my supervisor has been really great helping me sort of narrow down exactly what it is I'm interested in, not just in terms of like, you know, like the holistic things like uh, what... Um, what are you interested in? What moves you? Um, what's the heart of this issue? But also in practical things like, well, well, oh, you want to do this? Well, you'll need like ethical approval to that uh, for that. You know, it could take months. Uh, maybe steer away from that. You know, just like little things like that, uh, practical things. So uh, there's a little bit my personal experience, uh, my the course of my life that uh, caused me to choose what I'm doing, and partially the. Uh, very helpful influence of uh, of my supervisor, meet in the middle. That's great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so someone's mentioned also um, going a bit further back to the start, discussing the seminars that you were talking about that you've been involved in and the ones that happen kind of every couple of weeks in addition to regular teaching. Someone's asking how they can get involved in those and just kind of what the setup is. Is it kind of student led, lecture led? bit of a mix, um, external guests, maybe? It's basically we have, as Stuart said, every couple of weeks, um, it's part of what we call the Politics and International Relations Seminar Series. So every couple of weeks there will be a speaker. Sometimes it's external, sometimes internal. Um, usually it is, it is staff or as I say, external academics, but occasionally it can be PhD students who are talking about their their current research and what they're working on for their thesis. Um, they're relatively informal. Basically, you get an email. We have posters across the department advertising them, and we get um, um, emails are sent out. A lot of students, I'm afraid, sometimes seem to think that we don't really mean to invite them. But of course we do. We really, really want you to come um, and be our colleagues and enter into these debates. Um, Stuart has been has asked some incredibly pertinent questions when he has come that has been really helpful, not only for the speaker, but also for the staff, especially when it's external speakers, because we get to show off and go, look how great our students are, because they ask great questions. It makes us feel really cool. Um, so I think they're really nice. It's usually a setup of maybe 45 minutes of the presenter giving an overview of, of their work and then another 45 session, 45 minutes of Q&A, um, which ideally, you know, it should be all good natured and lovely. Sometimes it's really interesting to watch just to see how academics politely and diplomatically offer critique. And Stuart is laughing. Uh, yeah, you learn a lot about diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> in those Q&As. It's great. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you. Um, so one final question. I know we are um, running quite short on time, so I'll make this the last one. Someone asking about the research centres. Is there the opportunity to kind of get involved with these research centres as part of their master's studies? There's usually um, opportunities to get involved in terms of seeing what the centres are actually doing. Again, they may be doing presentations, offering, um, you know, workshops maybe. Sometimes, again, they bring in external speakers. So a little like the Politics and IR um, seminar series, there are ways to get involved with these centres. If you're super, super enthusiastic about a particular type of research, you can always sort of put yourself forward and say, I would really like to get involved here. Um, depending, of course, on what the centre is doing and availability will depend on whether there is that option for you to get in at this sort of 
dirty roots, as it were. But there's certainly opportunities to get involved to hear what things are, what centres are doing. And, you know, ideally, hopefully, there'd be places for you to, to really get yourself stuck in. But it all depends on what those centres are doing at any point and, and what the staff are doing. Absolutely. But as I say, it doesn't hurt to ask. Um, and you can always see what is happening. Um, that's great. Well, thank you both for such a great session. Um, and for everyone who sent in questions, thank you for those as well. Um, I'll just hand it over to the two of you to say thank you and to sign off. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you all who's attended. But can I also say a massive thank you to Stuart. Without you, without the student experience and experience and somebody that isn't getting paid to tell our student prospective students how brilliant we are is fantastic thank you you've done a brilliant job as you always do oh shucks thank you it was, it was great it was a pleasure to do it thank you so much uh sam for putting my name forward for this uh thank you margaret for arranging it and uh, uh being patient while i frantically tried to join this town hall uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh most of all thank you everybody for coming and listening uh it's been great Good luck with uh, all your future studies. Yes, good luck to everyone.